Yeah, we can begin. Okay, so we continue with the book on social and communal harmony and we're on the chapter on establishing an equitable society. Um, so far we read a very interesting sutta, the, a very famous sutta, the Sigalovada Sutta, which is all about responsibilities and how we relate to our, our, the, the uh, our relationships that we all have with our parents, with our um, co-workers, with our servants, and with our teachers. Uh, so that, that's a very well-known sutta, the Sigalo Vada Sutta. And we only read part of it. It's extremely long and very often quoted. And then we went on. So now we're going on into particular relationships. And we started with parents and children last week. And this week we're on to husbands and wives. So these are always very interesting uh, uh, it's kind of, kind of interesting how the what part of a relationship that the Buddha draws out when he um, speaks about husbands and wives, for example. So there are many aspects of a relationship, and let's see what the Buddha says about what is important. Of course, there are many other suttas on husbands and wives, I'm sure. But this particular one, let's see what the Buddha draws out. So on one occasion, the Blessed One was traveling along the highway between Madhura and Viranja, Viranja. And a number of householders and their wives were traveling along the same road. Then the Blessed One left the road and sat down on a seat at the foot of a tree. The householders and their wives saw the Blessed One sitting there and approached him. Having paid homage to him, they sat down to one side and the Blessed One then said to them. Householders, there are these four kinds of marriage, marriages. What for? A wretch lives together with a wretch. A wretch lives together with a goddess. A god lives together with a wretch. And a god lives together with a goddess. Interesting translations. Interesting, strong words. And how does a wretch live together with a wretch? Here, householders, the husband is one who destroys life, takes what is not given, engages in sexual misconduct, speaks falsely, and indulges in wines, liquor, and intoxicants the basis for negligence. He is immoral or bad character. He dwells at home with a heart obsessed by the stain of miserliness. He abuses and reviles ascetics and Brahmins. And his wife is exactly the same in all respects. It is in such a way that a wretch lives together with a wretch. And how does a wretch live together with a goddess? Here, householders, the husband is one who destroys life, who takes what is not given, engages in sexual misconduct, speaks falsely, and indulges in wines, liquor, and intoxicants, the basis for negligence. He is immoral of bad character. He dwells at home with a heart obsessed by the stain of miserliness. He abuses and reviles ascetics and Brahmins. It is in such a way that a wretch lives together 
with a, oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Yeah, together with a goddess, she. And how does a god live together with a wretch? Here, householder. The husband is one who abstains from the destruction of life, takes what is not given, engages in sexual misconduct, speaks falsely and indulges in wines, liquor and intoxicants, the, the basis of negligence. He is immoral or bad character. He dwells at home with a heart obsessed by the stain of miserliness. Uh, miserliness. My, uh, Mises, he abuses and reviles ascetics. Oh, sorry. The husband is one who abstains. Sorry, I read that wrong. Who does not abuse or revile ascetics, but his wife is one who destroys life. Sorry, I read that wrong. <laughs> who does not abuse, but his wife is one who destroys life, blah, blah, blah. Who abuses and reviles ascetics and prophecy. It is in such a way that a God lives together with a wretch. And how does a God live together with a goddess? Here, householders, the husband is one who abstains from the destruction of life, from etc., from wines, liquors, and intoxicants. He is virtuous, of, of good character. He dwells at home with a heart free from the stain of miserliness. He does not abuse or revile ascetics and Brahmins. And his wife is exactly the same in all respects. It is in such a way that a god lives together with a goddess. These householders are the four kinds of marriages. Sorry, I read that wrong. I read that too, too long, but I think you get the point. So, um, yeah. Uh, a wretch is one who is not only not keeping the five precepts, that the Buddha also mentions here, he is someone who is of bad character. He dwells at home with a heart obsessed by the stain of miserliness. He abuses and reviles ascetics and Brahmins. So he includes that as someone who, who he describes as a wretch. And... Um, Often when we live to live with people, you know, we kind of take the five precepts as uh, important and um, sort of a important principle to, uh, for us to live together. But here he also mentions the tendency towards not being generous, isn't it? When one person in a relationship enjoys, you know, uh, um, donating to charities, having, uh, I don't know, feeding people, not so much parties, but being ten be enjoys being generous and open-handed. But the other person in the relationship is like, no, no, you can't do that. You know, we've got to save for a rainy day. And it's actually with my parents sometimes. <laughs> Um, it makes it difficult. So I hope my mother doesn't listen. My dad is not listening to this. But anyway, <laughs> my mother has these secret stash of money that she has kept aside, and she gives she gives money to this this charity and that charity and that charity, and she just doesn't tell my dad about it. She said, "Well, I technically own fifty percent of everything he has." But Anyway, so it's a bit difficult sometimes to have a relationship when you are not on the same page when it comes to generosity. You think that would be something small when you first meet someone and, uh, you know, start a relationship and start, uh, uh, you know, start living together. But this is, this is um, yeah, a, a, a bone of contention when a couple doesn't see eye to eye. The other one is reviles ascetics and Brahmins. So again, I hate to say this to my parents sometimes, but 
<laughs> but uh, if one it delights in you know going to the monastery and meditating and uh, you know uh, loves some kind of spiritual practice, and the other one is like, oh, why are you going? Why are you going to the temple again? <laughs> or you know, why are you wasting your time meditating? What are you doing? Meditating, meditating, meditating. But uh, again, that is a difficulty in a relationship. So I thought that was very interesting that the Buddha actually pointed that out because we kind of go like, oh, well, we can live together. It doesn't matter. You know, I, I do my thing, you do your thing. And we'll just, um, but a relationship where both of them are on the same page when it comes to uh, their spiritual practice, that's when a god lives with a goddess and not a wretch with a god. I mean, that's very strong language. So uh, I, I just thought that was interesting when I read that sutta. And uh, perhaps others might, uh, others might have something to say. Anything that stands out to you? The other thing that Venerable Chanda noticed immediately when we read this last week was that householders and their wives. So wives are sort of chattel. There's the householders are the con, householder refers to obviously just as the, the male in the family and their wives are kind of appendages. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. But yet, even though that is how it's described, how it is, you know, how the word the wording is, still that equivalence of virtue and um, um, similar moral standards seems to be essential in a successful relationship. Any comments? Yes, Adam. Adam, may I ask you to unmute, please? Well, thank, thank you for this lovely summary. Well, I think you just touched upon the point there, but um, in, in this passage, there's very little distinction given so the difference between male and female attributes is that it's all to do with that, the internal qualities, the male and female characteristics are sort of um, uh, not prominent at all. Um, mm. So it was, it was their, you know, it's, it's their um, the qualities of the five precepts and the other uh, qualities that you mentioned. Um, you know, that's the whole heart of it. And uh, the rest of the, uh, the gender attributes are not, you know, are not gone into. Um, so I thought that was uh, very nice. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. The sutta before the Sikalo Vada Sutta had very specific duties of a husband and a wife. It was a slightly different. Uh, uh, aspect of the relationship but actually most of the time the Buddha really um, talks as he did in the Sigalo Vada Sutta it's mostly like this when there is it's the qualities of the mind rather than that their particular uh, roles that they play in the relationship but yeah yeah thank you <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, yes, MMB. Well, MMB is. Venerable Upeka, may I ask? The sutta promotes generosity, but in relation to the spending of the household money, would the Buddha also admire prudence? Yes, actually, that is a 
point, there are other sutras. Remember, we're only reading a sutra, so it's not to be taken in isolation. But there are other sutras where he does say how to spend your money. In fact, I wonder if I come to it. Um, anyway, oh yes, the next one is the proper use of wealth. I know, but that's not how to use money. That's that's uh, how you gain money. But yeah, no, that's also there. Anyway, the next sutra is the proper use of wealth. But um, yeah, he, he says, I can't remember what the percentage is, where it's like a quarter for yourself, a quarter for your um, family, and then a quarter for society and a quarter to be saved, something like that. I can't remember the exact uh, breakdown or the percentage, but something for saving, something for spending, something for society as at large. So uh, he has, he does speak about not just giving away willy nilly, you know, not thinking about, well, I still have to pay rent and I still have to buy food for the rest of the family and they still need to go to school. But uh, yeah, it is definitely spoken of being the the proper use of wealth as a, and uh, being prudent, as you say, with with your uh, yes. Interesting. While as 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 a monastics, we own nothing, so uh, that's quite a uh, quite a different ball game when you. The, how the use of well, uh, uh, the use of wealth, in, uh, use of money in a monastic setting, as opposed to the use of wealth in a family setting, where he does speak about saving, he does speak about uh, looking after household affairs, and yeah, yes, Sean, yes. John, may I ask you to unmute, please? Hello, yes. Um, Hello. I was just thinking, I mean, it's not really something that is pointed out in this sutta, but how if you're, you tend to be influenced by your other half, right? You Like you were saying, if one of you maybe donates to charity and things like that, and obviously this is referred to right in other sutras mm. that you know the company you keep and the friends mm. are very, one of the most important things on the path so it just made yeah. yeah made me think and and it started off with if you live with a wretch and we all without being judgmental about people you can see <laughs> certain people and and even actually I see it in myself sometimes like if someone is a bit mean with me or a bit mm. uh mean with you know in generosity and things mm. like that natural reaction is to yeah okay yeah like i'm not going to give you something okay <laughs> you're like that, right um whereas when you're around mm. people it flows much more freely mm. um and it just yeah it was just something that, that came up a, a thought that i thought was was quite interesting and putting it in the yeah wretch with a wretch and then miserly and miserly you know you could see how they could end up getting a lot worse than either one on their own and conversely two people mm. that are very virtuous enhance each other and I guess that also relates to you know when when you're around people you come to monastery and people that practice my behavior is a lot probably better mm. than it's then then it, it's more skillful because everyone else is more skillful it makes it easier and it make, you make more of an effort and you're more conscious so yeah I just that was just something that came up mm. that is that is so true Hopefully, if if two are different, the one raises 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 the other one up, and not the other way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, right. the importance of who we hang out with. I mean, the Buddha talks about it over and over again. You know, the your spiritual friendship is all of the holy life. We don't realize how easily we are influenced. We think that we're independent, and we make our, our own minds up, but we're so easily influenced by uh, by the people around us. So just to take care of that, take care of who who you associate with when, when you can make a choice, of course. The question is when you can't make a choice, <laughs> <laughs> what do you do then? 
But even then, I think there are times where, you know, there are certain people that are very, very close to you and that maybe you spend less time with them if you notice it's dragging down mm -hmm. your behaviour, you know? And yeah. it doesn't mean, and sometimes you have to think about that, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. Is this, is this, and then does it make our relationship worse as well because of that, you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, Kedwin. Kedwin, may I ask you to unmute, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, I um, have experience with this, uh, with having a difficult relationship with my mom. Um, and uh, I would notice um, that I was not happy about the um interactions between us mm -hmm. um like she would have harsh speech towards me and mm -hmm. my reaction would come up like you were saying Sean like I want to be harsh back and mm -hmm. I decided at a certain point that um uh you know I was noticing this over and over and the way that it felt in my body it just mm -hmm. felt so toxic for me to react in that way mm -hmm. and I wanted to stop doing that and so what I started doing was um having being prepared like in those interactions being prepared to um like I was just going to either leave the room or I was going to try to perform a kind act or make mm -hmm. a kind gesture every single time no matter what mm -hmm. and um it really changed the course of the relationship oh. So I would say, like, there was harsh speech, you know, coming mm -hmm. towards me. And I would say, mm -hmm. Mom, can I make you a cup of tea? I'm making tea right now. I'll mm -hmm. pour some for you. Mm -hmm. You know, just a little simple thing like that. It didn't have to be big. But it changed my energy and it changed the energy in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so there was more kindness than coming towards me. Um, so I just wanted to say that because it took me decades of life decades many decades of harsh speech between us for me to change that dynamic and you know it still happens sometimes mm. that I am harsh back mm. but then I can remember to oh that's right I have this this strategy and it works really beautifully so mm. thank you wow well, yeah thank you yeah when you hear stories like that, you think it's all worthwhile. It's worthwhile having suffered so much just to have learned that lesson. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so shall we move on to another sutta if there is... Uh, uh, there is uh, no uh, nothing else that anyone wants to add. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you for all sharing that, especially Kedwin. Um, but so we move on to the next sutta, which is on. For the welfare of the many. Monks or oh, monastics, when a good person is born in a family, it is for the good welfare and happiness of the people. It is for the good welfare and happiness of his mother or his or her mother and father for their wives and wife and children, for their servant, workers and helpers, for their friends and companions, and for their for ascetics and Brahmins as well. My goodness. Just as a great rain cloud nurturing all the crops appears for the good welfare and happiness of the people, so too. When a good person is born in a family, it is for the good welfare and happiness of many people. It is for the good 
welfare and happiness of his mother and father, etc., etc., all the way to ascetics and Brahmins. Wow. The power of a good person. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? When sometimes you see a, ch a family and they have a, a child who's just a, just a good kid, you know, he, he has, is, I don't know, you feel so happy for the family. He's generous, he's kind, um, he's, you know, all those nice qualities that not so much like we, we like, we like smart kids, don't we? They say all the sharp, smart, clever things. And you go like, oh, what a smart kid. Look at what he said. Grandparents are full of that smart things that their grandchildren said. But uh, the qual these qualities that the Buddha talks about when he's a, uh, has, he's a good person, when he, has whole, he or she has wholesome qualities of generosity, of thinking about others, looking after others, um, of, uh, you know, that uh, kindness and compassion, it really is a gift to the family. Of course, it's nice to have a smart kid as well, but um, yeah, yeah. But well, again, the question comes up when, when, when someone doesn't come across in the when in the beginning of their life as all those lovely qualities of being uh, kind and generous and thoughtful they could be they could be a black horse you know they could be someone who who comes later on in their life uh, uh, shows qualities that they never showed when they were small my my brother and I a little bit like that my brother was the 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 one who, you know, the class, the school teacher was always calling up my mother. He hasn't done his homework. He hasn't, you know, turned up for school. And I was the goody two shoes. So I'm a nun pick. <laughs> but in the end, you know, my 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 brother is a good he 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 was really naughty when he was little. But he's a good guy in a strange way. He's he's a he's got spiritual qualities that are were very latent when he was when he was young. But they were um, now he's almost fifty. But yeah, he's a dark horse. So when you have children, I guess you 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 have to love all of them the same way, regardless of what they. Uh, seem to be or what qualities that they seem to have when they're born so uh, yeah any anything that anyone would like to add on a good person born to a family Yeah. yeah. Please, may I ask you to unmute, please? I think you make a, a statement that the family will be pleased to have a, a child like that. But it depends what family. Uh, some family actually are very narrow-minded, racist, or um, not inclined to generosity and so on. And then the child is rejected uh, from this kind of family, and uh, and even punished for uh, giving whatever. And so that's a statement. I would say mm, I would be a bit wary about. It depends which family the child is born in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. True, but you wonder if, you know, if the family, if the child has very strong qualities, they might actually influence their parents. Well, I, I, I am speaking about a particular case where, uh -huh. in fact, uh, 
the child was very rejected by, by the parents and mm. by the siblings. Mm. And uh, yeah. I, I, I thought that was very sad. Um, yes. You know, and then it takes somebody very strong to keep right. up these qualities. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, yes. Despite the rejections, the mocking, is uh, yeah, disparaging mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Mm. That's that's a bit sad. Mm. I know the opposite as well. There's a. Uh, uh, in in our monastery in Perth, she's an old English woman who comes every week. Anyway, she, she passed away last year. Comes every week to the monastery. Extremely beautiful person. Um, but her mother was bipolar, and when she thinks about it, there were a lot of mad people in the family. She says she has a mad family. Her aunt this and her uncle that, they were all a little bit odd. But anyway, her mother was was mentally un, just, you know, loved her one moment, shouted at her another moment. But Pauline, I think just the strength of a character from another life, if you believe in other lives, but managed to a stay sane, but also be extremely, you know, have have uh, a very balanced mind just mm -hmm. simply mm -hmm. on the strength of her, her her past life practice I'm sure of it that she not only lived through a difficult childhood but she was a she was a beautiful she was extremely positive and 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 a good meditator good uh, powerful mind so, uh, yeah. I agree with you when you say about past lives, which gives you a kind of baggage. It mm. can be a very good baggage or it can be more problematic. Uh, but yeah. I, I do yeah. agree with you. And I, I think about this particular person and uh, mm. I've always thought if she had something from before. There was no other explanation I could think of, you know, that just carried her through, you know. And uh, yes, it, it was an interesting situation, mm -hmm. but it never changed. And now both the parents are dead, but the siblings still don't talk to her. Mm -hmm. so that's, yeah. uh, mm. How old is she now? This... Oh, she, she's not a young person. She's about 17 now. Ah, right, 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 yeah, you never know when we are born again, you know, what type of family, who we are, our parents are going to be, so it is kind of scary, but the more we cultivate our minds and are able to, you know, have those good qualities, the more likely that in our next life we would be able to have some chance of maintaining them. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're completely right on that. I think Big uh, Rudy, I remember listening to him once and he was saying, um, you don't carry some memories of this life, or at least you've got to have achieved quite a, but it, it every thought you have, every act you, you every action you, you do actually leaves an imprint on the mental continuum. And I was absolutely fascinated with that. And I thought, oh my goodness, I better be careful. But I think he was right. Uh, you know, you, yeah. Having said that, I can't remember my past lives. So <laughs> <laughs> I will have to trust Biku Bodhi on this one. <laughs> yeah. I don't think many of us actually do remember our past lives, but <laughs> I think it might be a bit scary, you know. <laughs> yeah, it probably is. It probably is. It would in fact, it would probably scare us out of Sansar if he actually did see our past lives. 
scares out of samsara. I like this expression. I will remember that one. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Any comments? Uh, any thoughts on on this sutta? Or as we go on, we're going to cover a lot of suttas this today. By the looks of it. Yeah. Okay. We will go on then. Okay. Like the Himalayas. Monks or monastics based on the Himalayas, the king of mountains, great sal trees grow in five ways. What five? They grow in branches, leaves, and foliage. They grow in bark. They grow in shoots. They grow in softwood. And they grow in hardwood. Based on the Himalayas, the king of mountains, great sal trees grow in these five ways. So too, when the family head is endowed with faith, the people in the family who depend on him or her grow in five ways. What five? They grow in faith. They grow in virtuous behavior. They grow in learning. They grow in generosity. And they grow in wisdom. When the head of the family is endowed with faith, the people in the family depend on him, depending on him, depend on him, grow in these five ways. Yeah. Ah, again, how important, how, how significant our parents are. Yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a manager. Mm -hmm. And as, as Sean said, how one good person can uplift everyone else particularly the head in the family head of the family so um and again the qualities that the buddha draws out you know he a, the a head of the family someone who is a good fed, for head of the family is endowed with faith virtuous behavior learning generosity and wisdom Interesting, comparing that to the branches, the bark, the shoots, and the softwood. Faith, virtuous behavior, learning, and learning, generosity, and wisdom. Yeah. What are the qualities society nowadays looks for in, uh, in the head of the family? Probably not, probably not so much to do with virtuous behavior. Well, yes, probably virtuous behavior. Faith, generosity and wisdom. Yeah, as well as learning. So someone who is, I guess, uh, um, educated, who has, um, I don't know, interesting, educated, knowledgeable, knowledgeable in his field, whether he's a farmer or whether he's an engineer, whatever it is, skilled in his field. And also wise. How wonderful to have a parent like that. <laughs> yeah, how to be a parent like that if you have children. I don't know if children necessarily appreciate it, but <laughs> yeah. Any comments? Or... Hmm. It was very quiet today. 
Yes, Sean. Sean, may I ask you to unmute again? Sorry, I think I unmuted <laughs> myself. Um, yeah. Um, yes, when you said about the learning, uh, it's funny because I actually understood it to mean learning, you know, about the teachings rather than anything mm. else. Just because obviously mm. of what this is. Um, so I was actually related to just learning. So you could, in theory, and I suppose probably back then, you wouldn't have been, un, I don't know, uneducated, but you wouldn't necessarily have had to be educated. Um, but I, and then just makes me think maybe about being open minded, about wanting to to being fixed in your ways and ways things are. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably more like it then because of the context of all the other, uh, yeah, virtuous behavior, generosity, and it's probably learning as being open to, to, un, to right view, really, at the end of the day. Yeah, the teachings, <laughs> right? Uh, yes. Uh, Benjamin says, faith is not defined here. What does the head of the family have faith in? Or is it just about the quality of faith itself and not the object of it? Presumably, it's in faith in the Buddha's teaching. Um, but yeah, sometimes these suttas are spoken to someone who is, you know, just a random passerby, so might not necessarily have any idea what the Buddhist teaching is um, yeah good question a good Christian why not uh, yes they have faith mm. I'm sure it does mean faith in the Dhamma though but uh, yeah, but heck, better to have faith in something something good than no faith at all. So, uh, Manori, learning is com in th is three compared to the shoots of the tree. Hmm. Learning mind helps in the growth, maybe. Hmm. True. True. The sort of uh, mind that goes out and goes out to expand its sort of initial little comfort zone. Yeah, true. It's probably learning in the sense of, of, uh, of expanding your mind. Anything, any other interesting thoughts on this? Well, we're going to zip along today. Yeah, no thoughts? Yes. Anyway, so we will continue. Oh, yes, Adam. Yeah. Adam, may I ask you to unmute, please? Well, it's just a tiny point. Um, but in the last sutta, we had the... Um, uh, nurturing all the crops and here we have the grow mm. um, the grow in five ways so you've got that natural um, natural um, naturalness to, to, to how things unfold mm. and, and that's a sort of um, right. natural process okay. there right right oh very very good interesting yeah, it's a natural unfolding from faith to virtuous behavior. It must be faith in the Buddha's teaching. Faith to virtuous virtuous behavior, to learning, to generosity and wisdom. You're right. Yeah, it's a natural unfolding. And we can't jump to wisdom. So it is a natural unfolding. Mm, thank you. Yes, uh, Jetsuma. Uh, Sumna, may I ask you to unmute, please? 
Sunma. 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 Not yet. Yes, not yet. What is the difference between a jet and a sunma? Uh, <laughs> a sunma means a member of a discipline group. Okay. Jet sunma is uh, someone who is masterful. Oh. In, <gasps> at like tens and palmos, you know. Oh, right. He is a jet sunma. I see, <laughs> I see. He has the title. I see, I see. I just thought of a little thing I, I wanted to share. Yeah. That this, to me, the soft wood mm. uh, symbolizes generosity because you, you have to uh, soften mm. in order to be more generous sometimes. Mm. Like the man, the man who goes around the car. I lived in India, so the man who goes around the cars uh, or the boy holding their hand out. Mm. Um, rickshaw driver said, "No, no, don't, don't, don't give him. Mm. He has a flower, you know, something plastic flower." So, uh, yeah, I gave him. I said, "I, I didn't want the flower, you know." I went like this, <laughs> it's like that. I think, um, and. Seeing the beggars there, uh, women, women with babies. I've heard stories. It's not their babies, uh, but still, in all, uh, they need money. They need to eat. Mm. Mm. And even if if people uh, are drunk, or you you could see, or you could see they're uh, addicted to something, they still need to eat. So I, I think uh, if I could be more soft wood, I would like that quality. I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. We were talking earlier, I was talking to Chi, who's in the room here today, about um, giving, well, we were talking about beggars because she's a social worker and she works in with a lot of uh, drug addicts or people who have been on the streets or homeless people. And she said, well, you know, everyone is there because they have been, they're asking for money because they need it, whether it is even to feed a drug addiction or buy it, uh, you know, we don't know what they need their money for. Perhaps they, you know, they seem to be fussy, but for whatever reason, they, they need it. Yeah, so who are we to be high and mighty about um well, they shouldn't be begging or whatever it is. Yeah. It's a hard one. In India, yeah, there's uh, just, just uh, so many skeptics and so many beggars. You don't really know when to give, when not to give. But um, they're all there for a reason. They all need money for whatever reason. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for sharing. Um, Liz. Liz, may I ask you to unmute, please? Hi. I, sorry, it's me again, but I think it's uh, important when you say to our face. I think it's even the attitude to accept that something or somebody external might know better than you. Mm. And that's an important attitude because now if you see on social media and so on, suddenly there are people who know very little about vaccination and have very strong opinions uh, about uh, COVID vaccinations or about uh, things they don't know anything about. But just the attitude of saying, I don't know, 
somebody who is more qualified than me or who shows a better example or just putting these seeds in mm-hmm. the mind of your family, of your children and so on is very important to have the humility to say, I'm not an expert in that, but there are people who know better than me. Mm-hmm. I think that's very important to show as an example. I mean, so maybe having faith dot, dot, dot is what is needed, you know, just that way of recognizing mm-hmm. that somebody might know better than you do mm-hmm. is an important um, yeah, quality, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you for putting that uh, bigger picture on the word faith. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. We're so, somehow taught taught to be um, so sure of our opinions and so sure of our um, uh, our perspective of the world, but just to be humble and yeah, open to something that is. Well, we just we just don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so um, we'll do one last sutta, I guess. What do you think? Namaste. sutta? Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, ways of seeking wealth. The householder who seeks wealth righteously, without violence, and makes himself happy and pleased, and shares it and does meritorious deeds, and uses that wealth without being tied to it, infatuated with it, and blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it and understanding the escape, he may be praised on four grounds. Wow, I'll read that again. The householder who seeks wealth righteously, without violence, and makes himself happy and pleased, and shares it and does meritorious deeds, and uses that wealth without being tied to it, infatuated with it, and blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it and understanding the escape, he may be praised on four grounds. The first ground on which he may be praised is that he seeks wealth righteously without violence. The second ground on which he may be praised is that he makes himself happy and pleased. The third ground on which he may be praised is that he shares the wealth and does meritorious deeds. The fourth ground on which he may be praised is that he uses that wealth without being tied to it, infatuated with it, and blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it and understanding the escape. This householder may be praised by on these four grounds. Wow. Just as from a cow comes milk, from milk comes curd, from curd butter, from butter ghee, and from ghee comes cream of ghee, which is reckoned the foremost of all these. So among all householders, the foremost, the best, the 
preeminent, the supreme and the finest is the one who seeks wealth righteously, without violence, and having son done so, makes himself happy and pleased, and shares the wealth and meritorious deeds, and does meritorious deeds, and uses that wealth without being tied to it, infatuated with it, and blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it, and understanding the escape. Well, there you go. That's, that's a lot, isn't it? Our whole relationship with money and our whole relationship with, our, with how we make money and how we spend it. And it's such a, it's such a, uh, 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 I don't know. There is a, there is, there's danger in it, danger in it. And, but there is also how we use it wisely. Yes, Manori. Um, yeah, the venerable, it, the end of it, can you, you know, expand it a little bit uh, without um, seeing the danger in it mm -hmm. and understanding, understanding the escape? The escape. Yeah. yeah, good point. Usually that uh, understanding the escape usually refers to uh, the noble eightfold path. <laughs> so I'm I'm not sure what in what context this is used. You, like I said, seeing the danger is is often used in um, um, seeing the danger in uh, sensual pleasures. Seeing that's where I usually it's used, seeing the danger in um, the the uh, yeah the objects of the five senses. That's usually how it is used and. Understanding the escape is usually the path, the noble eightfold path. So, yeah, that's probably what it refers to. Using money wisely, meaning not getting caught up in sensual pleasures with the use of money. Yeah. Hmm. So, so in in I I, I mean there, there's there's a a lot of very use very pointed information because probably from time immemorial people have been obsessed with money collecting too much of it and <laughs> enough of it there's never enough of it there's all you know. <laughs> And then you go on to even uh, immoral ways of accumulating money. You can see politicians, I don't know, who seem to have no qualms about uh, being corrupt, who seem to have enormous amounts of money and don't think it's enough. So, yeah, wealth is a... Wealth is a great source of, of suffering if it's not used properly. Yeah. Well, Richard, Richard is waving his hand. He's waving his hand, not his virtual hand. Perhaps Richard can go first. Yeah. Richard, may I ask you to unmute, please? <clears throat> yes, um, uh, hi, Venable. As um, far as money is concerned, I think it's... I found for myself personally that if I actually earn my money, you know, you know, for example, if I have a job which I used to work for myself, I, I've just retired, you know. So, like in my last job, I worked, you know, as a steward. I worked in Wembley Stadium, and I enjoyed um, being a steward, you know, and I did it legally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I illegally worked as a steward and I got paid for it and so I actually owned my money you know by law so you know I went to work and I actually earned this money and so you know I mean you could say of course in the Buddhist sense you know trying to follow the noble eightfold path 
that I'm actually following the right livelihood, you know, and doing the right, you know, with the right intention, right action, right livelihood, right effort, you know. So, I'm, you know, so as far as money is concerned, you know, I'm actually doing it rightly, you know. But then by comparison, I have a friend of mine who likes to bet, you mm. know, so he goes to the betting shop. Mm. And he has actually his own money. You know, he's also a pensioner, you know, and he goes to the betting shop, which I go with him. And for myself, I've never betted in my life. Mm. And he has his own money. And he's not stolen his money, mm -hmm. you know, and he goes to the betting shop and he bets, mm -hmm. you know, on these machines. So it's not stolen, you know, and it's not like he's, you know, and it's not like he's um, intentionally, mm -hmm. you know, um, trying to steal the money. Mm -hmm. But he's, in a way, he's, you know, he's very sticky. You know, he's got the intention to make money. You know, so like it's, you know, I don't know if I have to explain, it's like emotionally, he's mm -hmm. very attached to the money. So for me, it just feels like it's not right. You know, he's not like really doing it with the right intention from a Buddhist point of view. Mm -hmm. So it makes me feel like I'm some holy person <laughs> being all righteous, you know, holy rich. How dare I say this? But basically, it just doesn't feel right that this my friend can go to the betting shop and, you know, with his own money, which he has got, you yeah. know, because it's very addictive. Yeah. You know, very addictive going gambling. Right. With yeah. his own money. So, yeah. like, it, it is in a way mm. like he's not using his money wisely. Mm. You know, so, like, if he's using his money, you know, you know, I suppose in a wise way. Mm. So it's very subjective, I think, actually, money, mm. you know, as well. So, you know, I suppose you could you could actually, I mean, how is the Buddha's con idea? If, I mean, I suppose you could really logically say, if I went to a bank and I raided the bank, I stole some money, but mm. then I actually used the money in a skillful way, you know, like if I want to do, if I go to a bank, I steal hundreds of millions of pounds, <laughs> then I donate it to your to your nunnery, so that yourself can then build the nunnery in in, in Oxford. Would that be okay? <laughs> that would be a, that would be a valid. I think you might get into a bit of trouble. <laughs> yeah, but if I did it with the right intention, though. <laughs> It still would not be valid, would it, really? <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> the sort of method, that's a bit extreme, but <laughs> simply, I don't yeah. know. So that's, I find that trouble with money as well. Yes, so that, yes. You know, so maybe yeah. the aspect of what the Buddha is saying, that mm. I suppose if you actually earn your money in a skillful way, mm. by right um, livelihood, then just by simply doing that, it's actually you actually um, get rewarded in the here and now by actually doing that. You know, it's really nice. It just feels nice to mm. actually own your money mm. with it because you know that it's the right intention. Mm. You yeah. actually are entitled to the money. Yeah. That's what yeah. my thought. You know. Yes, um, yes. Your, your poor friend probably doesn't quite uh, know the joy of being having money right oh, I, I told him loads of times so i'm <laughs> standing there getting very bored and he just stands there and he loves his gambling yeah he actually uses me as his lucky charm oh, right. <laughs> yeah, because I, he often wins he always wins with me when i'm there with him i'm his lucky charm <laughs> there's and a comment he, here yeah. richard please don't do it <laughs> i know yeah i know I'm just joking. Oh, oh, gee, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't really do it. In a way. There's a, there's I'm joking. A, there's a chi here wants to make this uh, comment about gambling. I, yeah, sure. Yeah. I think I have to completely agree with you, Richard. Um, 
I am guessing because with gambling, although it's his own money, he's not stealing, he's not killing. I he's think not. it probably uh, affects his quality of mind somehow because you have to think a lot about uh, money, usually if you're doing something like gambling. How much do I have in the bank? How much am I going to use today? Yeah, sure. Well, how should I bet it? How should I not bet mm. it? You have to strategize. <laughs> Whereas as a steward, you wouldn't obsess about money so much. You just yes, work and you're yeah. done. Mm. Yeah, because I because I'm standing there, some lesson standing next to my friend, and he is literally shaking physically with the enjoyment of it all. But at the same time, you can see that he's um he's getting very stressed out. Mm. So it's like a real love hate relationship with this thing. Yeah. So it just doesn't feel like it's very skillful means yeah. to deal with his money. Yeah. You know, so it's all legal, but at the same time, it doesn't feel right. You know. Well, gambling is a well-known addiction. Yes, of course, there's yeah. there's okay. a Benjamin. Ben, sorry, we, we're coming to the end, and I just yes, want to read Benjamin's uh, comment before finishing off. Manu, sure. finishing off. Uh, thank you. Anyway. Um, uh, Benjamin says, I remember Ajahn Brown making a distinction between gambling and gaming, going to the casino with the intention to spend X amount on having fun there, rather than hoping to win as a wiser way, perhaps still not as good as just not going to the casino, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe just don't go to the casino. <laughs> anyway, we'll end on that note and Manori can um, wrap up for us. Thank you yeah. for sharing. So yeah. on behalf of all of us here, thank you very much, Vernipa, um, for the wonderful, uh, very enriched teachings today in this Sutta discussion. Um, uh, it's a very interesting few um, headings there. So uh, for us as a community, you know that we are getting uh, ready for the completion of the new monastery and the big mall. Uh, the date is only in two weeks time. Uh, and also there are some exciting events coming. Uh, if you see uh, the Anukampa Projects event page, you'll see there is Ajahn Pramali is coming uh, to the UK and there are some talks uh, across the cities and uh, then there is a one day uh, retreat as well in Oxford and then Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda is doing an online retreat I think Venerable Upeka uh, in that as well um, uh, so there are a lot of activities there uh, and um, so your donations are most welcome in this exciting state of the new monastery development um, so the the way we do is, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the the nuns um, and the monks they don't uh, use them use their uh, money and um, they teach us and look after us spiritually and then we look after them uh, physically. So that's how that's how uh, it develops as a wholesome society, uh, wholesome Buddhist society, um, and um, uh, so. Uh, uh, with your generosity, like why the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project uh, is uh, providing all these teachings free and these valuable Dhamma talks and many more in the YouTube, uh, as well as there's meditation retreats, all those things can be done because of your generosity. And the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project is, has great plans for the future with the new monastery. Uh, that uh, the women can um, uh, fully ordain there in the future. So it is a great opportunity which uh, the UK uh, doesn't have and in very rare opportunity in the whole world as well. It's very difficult to find uh, fully ordained nuns' monasteries. So um, you can make a donation or a standing order uh, and um, by a bank transfer or by PayPal. Uh, in our page, Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project, uh, forward slash donate. 
Uh, and uh, if you want to get more involved, uh, like food or there are different ways, there's a needed items list. Uh, if you can see in our website, there are different ways to uh, get involved in the community. Uh, it is a great community. Thank you very much for coming today. Okay, so that is the end of today's Sutta class. If uh, everyone would like to unmute and say goodbye, they're welcome. But uh, see you tomorrow. Good.